Do I need the microphone for him? Yes? It's better. Those who understand English perfectly, uh, raise the hand. Majority. Anyway, um, okay. I will speak English. I know that there is translation for those who don't understand well English. I'm happy to welcome you and to talk to you about the situation of the Christian community in the Holy Land in the context, special context, that we are living a geopolitical context. Because our faith, we live it not in the clouds, we live it on Earth. Someone can come here. So I feel protected by the seems archdeacon. It's okay for you, or I disturb by my. Uh, do I disturb you by the microphone, those who listen to the translation? No? In the 7th century, all Palestine was Christian. Until 638, one Islam came here. Today, after 13 centuries, in Palestine and Israel and Jordan also, which are parts of the diocese, the percentage of Christians is below 2%. You can deduct that an enormous change has taken place between the 7th century and this century. But we don't want to cry on the past. We don't want to uh, use the past as a wedding wall. We want to talk about the present and describe how do we live here our faith. The total number of Christians, in terms of figures, is 400,000 Christians between Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. More than half of them live in Jordan. The other half, or a little bit less, live between Israel and Palestinian territories. Palestinian territories have only 50,000 Christians. It's a small number. Uh, included Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, only 11,000 Christians live in a city of 1 million of 800,000 people. Jerusalem has 800,000 people. Christians are around 11,000 only. Also speaking about Jerusalem, I have to say that the change is, here was drastic. The change was drastic because within a short time, between 1922 and today, 80 years exactly, uh, the percentage changed drastically. In 1922, Jerusalem was a small city where there were 14,000 Christians. 14,000 Christians, more than today. But the Muslims were 13,000. And the Jews were 36,000, because at that time, the exodus of Jews from Europe and the, the Jewish immigration started. So they started to become majority in Jerusalem in that year. Don't forget, it was the time of the British mandate in Jerusalem, who facilitated the coming of Jews 
to the Holy Land, to Palestine. It was the name of that time. It was all called Palestine. It was the official name of this part of the world between Mediterranean and to the Jordan. To that, today, the name is Israel for 78% of the old Palestine, and the other is the Palestinian occupied territories on the 22% of the historic Palestine. Uh, if in Palestine there are only 50,000 Christians, in Israel, whose area is bigger, live 140,000 Christians, all Arabs. Beside them, beside all these Arabs, 400,000 between Jordan and Palestine and Israel, we have to mention also the existence of 230,000 foreigner workers. 230,000 foreigner workers who live in Israel. Also 100,000 Christian foreigner workers who live in Jordan. This is besides the local numbers. So you can understand that uh, we are not alone in the Holy Land as Arabs, Christians, but we are beside others who have different languages. These foreigner workers are Christians coming from Filipino, Philippines, Sri Lanka, India, West, West East Europe countries, and so on. Some came from Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea. But last weeks, Israel uh, put them out of the country, especially those who came from South Sudan. They were around 6,000 people. They were seeking here political asylum after the war that was very strong and violent between North and South, now it stopped. But also there are uh, some uh, Sudanese coming from uh, what we call this country where there is a war in Sudan. Uh, it's not the South, it's um, Darfur, thank you, it's Darfur. Many are coming from Darfur, they are both Muslims and Christians. But Israel now wants that they leave the country. Although in Darfur the situation is very conflictual still. We have to add to all these figures 10,000 Jews who believe in Jesus as Messiah, who continue to be Jews and believe in Jesus at the same time. This is not normal. Generally, when we say a Jew is someone who expects the Messiah. When we say someone who believes Jews is, is the Messiah, is a Christian. But these people, 10,000, they remain Jews. They are not baptized in the church. They don't belong to any Christian church. They call themselves Messianic Jews. They remain Jews, but they believe in Jesus as Messiah. And they are very missionary, very missionary. Uh, today I have read in the newspaper that the Knesset members found yesterday in their box, everyone found a Bible with Old and New Testament. So they were angry with a very uh, strong reaction. How can these Messianic Jews put in our box the New Testament? Because for them, the New Testament, for Jews, is a book which is false because it speaks about Jesus as Messiah. It's not accepted. So a good Jewish cannot read the New Testament, especially that Jews suffered all their history because they crucified Jesus. So this book, for them, is blasphemous. It's the reason of all their suffering. So a good pious, devout Jew cannot read the New Testament. So putting the New Testament along with the Old Testament, the Bible, in the books of the PM members is a criminal act. So this was uh, an article that I read today in Jerusalem Post.
enough about figures, but before coming to the reality of how we live, I would like to mention also that in Israel live a very small Hebrew-speaking community. They are Christians who came from Judaism. They are Catholics. Some are Protestants. And they live here their faith. They pray, practice, sing, do their liturgy in Hebrew, while the majority of Christians do their liturgy in Arabic. I attended a liturgy in Hebrew the other day in Jerusalem. It was a very nice community. They used the guitar, modern songs in Hebrew, that uh, some of their musicians composed. It's a very small community. The Protestant is maybe 1,000 only. The Catholic is like 500 only. But the Catholic community has a patriarchal vicar, patriarchal vicar, who takes care of them. He is one of the five patriarchal vicars of the diocese. One is in Cyprus, a Franciscan friar, who is in charge of the Catholics of Cyprus, where the majority are, as you know, Orthodox. Um, then we have this Jesuit who is in charge of the Hebrew-speaking community. He comes from South Africa. He is a Jesuit. He converted himself, was baptized here, and ordained priest here. Uh, then there are two, uh, three uh, auxiliary bishops who are vicars for the patriarch, one in Amman, Jordan, one in Nazareth, and one myself in Jerusalem. This is the uh, organization of our diocese in terms of hierarchy. And the archbishop here is called Patriarch. It's a prestigious and historical title given to our diocese since the fifth century. They established it during the Crusades. Uh, and given in the 5th century to five bishops only because of the value of the seat of the diocese. It was Constantinople, Constantinople, uh, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Rome. There were five patriarchs. But in Rome, Benedict XVI uh, refused the title as Patriarch of the West by respect to the East, which uses this title. So he doesn't want this title for himself. It was cancelled. But in the past, the Pope was considered as Patriarch of the West. Maybe his refusal of this title is for another reason. Maybe it makes him equal to the other Patriarchs, Oriental Patriarchs, and this is not our ecclesiology. The Pope of Rome is more than a Patriarch of the West. He is successor of Peter and vicar of Jesus Christ. So uh, it may be also for a theological reason, not only for a ecumenical reason. Let us come now to our life in the Holy Land. Uh, I would like to read our life in the Holy Land with the eyes of the last synod of the Middle East which took place in the year 2010, you remember. In 2010, there was a famous synod of two weeks in Rome. Uh, all the bishops of the Middle East, around 85, were present. And at the end of this synod was produced a message to the people of God in the Middle East, where lived around 16 million being Christians, and also were taken 44 recommendations, propositions, something to be done, practical things. All these were the result and the fruits of the uh, Synod of Rome. And you know that on the coming of September, on the coming September, Benedict XVI will come to Beirut in Lebanon to give to the bishops his post-synodal 
exhortation, which is the fruit of the Spirit. So we are looking forward to receiving from him in Beirut between the 13th and the 15th of September uh, this document. It means that we have to read it again and again and to put it into practice because it is the theological fruit and the pastoral fruit of the Spirit. Maybe someone will tell what the Spirit gave to the churches of the Middle East. Uh, I cannot talk to you now about the 44 propositions, because there are 44, and we risk to remain here until midnight, and it's warm, and I don't believe that it is useful now to tell you about all the 44 recommendations. But you can tolerate me if I speak only about five points. It's more tolerable. About five important points that we can remember and memorize from this sermon. Do you follow well the translation? Yes, perfect. Great no complaint. So we thank the translator. Thank you, Father, for your good work. Um, the five important topics tackled by the Synod are the following. The first one is the following. The bishops should work together to strengthen the faith of the Christian communities in the Middle East. It's about strengthening the faith. Strengthening the faith. You may say, we need that everywhere. This is true. This is true. Our work, wherever we are, first of all, is to strengthen the faith of our communities. In the Middle East or in South America or elsewhere, because without faith, there is no church. If church is a family, a faith-based family. Without faith, we don't have this spiritual family. So we need really faith. And in the Middle East, the problem is that all people are believers. All people are believers. But uh, they need deepening their faith. I can say even all the Christians of the Middle East come to the sacraments without exception. Few exceptions. Uh, in the Middle East, we baptize our children with that confirmation. No one saying, I don't want to baptize my son. This doesn't happen here. It may happen in other countries, but not in the Middle East. Here, here, people here are very religious. It's very, where socially and religiously things are, go together and are combined. We have the risk of having a social faith. Before this reason, the Senate asked that we strengthen the faith of our communities based on the word of God. And there are two recommendations which speak about the necessity for the people of God to have a meditated and prayerful reading of the Bible. A meditated and prayerful reading of the Bible. This is what one week after that came to us in the famous uh, letter or encyclical of Father, Verbum Domini. It was, it came just after the Synod of the Middle East, the Verbum Domini, the Word of God. And it's, it spoke in long and large about the importance of reading, meditating, praying, living the Word of God. Without the Word of God, we can't have a living faith, a relationship between the God of, of the covenant and ourselves. Our relationship is based on what he speaks to us in the Holy Scripture. This is the first point. Second point. The Spirit asked all the bishops to foster more communion between the different churches, Catholic churches of the Middle East. Do you know how many Catholic churches we have in the Middle East? Can you know? Catholic Church in the Middle East. That we call patriarchates. This is the official name 
of each church. It's called, they are called patriarchates. How many patriarchates, Catholic, Catholic patriarchates we have in the East? Can you guess, please? Less. Seven. We can try to, to mention them. In Lebanon, we call the Christian of Lebanon Meronites, okay? And they have a patriarch. Each, each church has a, its as head a patriarch. In Egypt, they are called Coptos. In Iraq, Chaldeans. Chaldeans. And we have three other Catholic churches which are oriental. The Melkites, Greek Catholics, the Syrian Catholics, and the Armenian Catholics. Uh, what is that, uh, the difference between, let us say, uh, a patriarch of the East and an archbishop in New York or Paris or London? An archbishop in the West is responsible only of his territory. Only of his territory. It means the territory of his diocese, either Paris or London or New York, but the geography. But the um, Oriental Patriarch has authority on his people all over the world. It means all the Moronites, even in the USA, Canada, Australia, Europe, are under the jurisdiction of the Maronite Patriarch in Beirut. He sends for them bishops, he sends priests, he organizes their life. The same for the other patriarchates, Coptic, uh, Syrian Catholic, uh, Armenian Catholic, etc. On these seven patriarchates, there is one exception which seems out of the series. What is the name of this patriarchate? Which is called patriarchate, it's in the east, but it has some substantial differences with the others. What is it? Yeah. Latin Patriarchate, where you are. Because the Latin Patriarchate, uh, the Latin Patriarch has authority only within the borders of the Latin Patriarchate. It means Jordan, Palestine, Israel, and Cyprus. Cyprus for the Catholic Latin uh, right. But our Patriarch has no authority on the Latin who immigrated from here in the States. Although, in collaboration with the dioceses there, we sent three, four priests, but these priests uh, also follow the orders which come from the dioceses there in the diaspora. This is the second uh, topic to create more communion between the seven patriarchates. It's important. Communion here is a little bit missing in the East. We need more communion to work together. In the same parish, we find, we find three schools. One is Latin, one is Milkite, one is Orthodox. Why to have three Christian schools and the three of them may be half empty? So we need really to work together pastorally and on all levels. This is one of the recommendations of the uh, Synod, to work together. For this reason, we created in, the, in Jerusalem what we call the Assembly of the Bishops of the Holy Land. We are around 10 bishops. We work uh, also with the Custos of the Holy Land in order to uh, organize the pastoral work of our churches in the Holy Land. Churches means Catholic churches, Latin church, Greek Catholic church, Armenian Catholic, Syrian Catholic, etc. So all the bishops should work together and we meet twice a week, uh, twice a year, excuse me, twice a year. What is the third point? It is how to foster and promote the ecumenical dialogue with the non Catholics. Uh, the Middle East is very divided. We have many churches. You can guess that most of the heresies of the first ten centuries were born here. Were born here. 
So we have the post Chalcedonian schism, and we have also we have also the great Oriental schism between Orthodox and Catholics. Everything started here. The Protestant uh, separation was in Europe, not here. But at least two major schisms, divisions, started in the Middle East. Uh, we have many churches, 13 different bishops in Jerusalem itself, and all these divisions are visible in our Middle East. For this reason, the Senate asked us to promote uh, more ecumenical dialogue, and we are taking this seriously. One of the examples of our taking seriously this issue <coughs> is that we decided, with the approval of Rome, to unify the calendar of Easter. In Jordan, since, since 30 years, we celebrate Easter together, according to the Julian calendar. Uh, in Palestine, more than half of the uh, parishes have already unified Easter together, Ramallah area and the north. Since the coming Easter, all the dioceses, all the dioceses, Cyprus, Israel, Jordan, Palestine, will be celebrating Easter with the Orthodox. And coming Easter will have one month of difference between the Gregorian and the Julian calendar. So this step, was taken by the bishops here in order to live together the main feast of Christianity, which is Easter. Especially in front of Jews and Muslims who are shocked by our differences in the most simple things, such as the calendar. So I believe that it is a courageous step. But I should to confess that this courageous step was taken upon pressure of the people. It is not only because of the holiness of the bishops and priests and our ecumenical movement, but under pressure of the people who are tired of celebrating Easter in two calendars, especially in the same family, there are people who are Catholic and who are Orthodox. They are tired of celebrating twice Easter. So they were so tired that well, they have done pressure on us. And I am happy that we are pressured because we need also to be pressured. Word. Fourth point, we should be happy we are in the fourth point. It means we have only two. <laughs> More than half has been said. The fourth point is how to practice the interfaith dialogue, interreligious dialogue. You know that in the Middle East we have two main uh, religions uh, Islam, majority, and Judaism, majority in Israel. So Christians have to live as minorities between others who are majority. Uh, how to create a dialogue, how to continue the dialogue between ourselves and the others. The Synod invited us strongly to this dialogue. This dialogue is a must. It's not optional. It should be done. It's not only because we are minority. It's because Jesus himself practiced this dialogue. You remember in the Gospel, Jesus accepted to talk to the Samaritan woman, to the uh, Roman soldier, to the Canaanite Syrophoenician lady who, whose daughter was hit by him. So Jesus was open uh, uh, against what his fellow uh, men used to do not to mix with pagans, but Jesus accepted to mix with pagans, with sinners, with many different peoples. So what Jesus has done is for us a rule. So the uh, interfaith dialogue for us is a must. And you remember the last two visits of, the, of Pope John Paul II and of Benedict XVI, when they came to Jerusalem, one of the most important things they asked to put on their program is an interfaith meeting. I remember very well the interfaith meeting of Notre Dame, where you are living, in the year 2000, that John Paul, the blessed John Paul asked. It was a very, very difficult thing to prepare at that time. Very difficult. And I can say it uh, 
as a personal experience, I was requested at that time. I was the rector of the seminary in Beit Jala, and I was requested to prepare this meeting. It was not easy because we had to deal with rabbis, with imams, with muftis, with all kinds of mentalities, with orthodox, with Catholics, and to put a program together, it was not easy. It was more difficult than all the other programs, masses, and you know how it is difficult to run a puppet program, you know that, by experience. So it was not easy to prepare this meeting in Jerusalem. I, I just did one difficulty, but the program was planting together of an olive tree. It is still there in Notre Dame, the tree that should have been planted by the three religious leaders, the Holy Father, the Mufti, and the Great Rabbi. Finally, we didn't succeed in combining this, and the Pope planted the tree alone. You know why? Because the two others didn't want that their hands touch each other. It was a pity. It was a pity. Other difficulties. We asked the three leaders to give us ahead the speeches. The Mufti refused, and the great rabbi, until the last moment, didn't tell us if he would come or not. And finally, the Mufti didn't come, he sent another one. So practically, they refused to give the paper. And we told them that we want an inter-religious speech. They have done a political speech. So this is not what we were expecting. It was an inter-religious dialogue and not a political dialogue. Other difficulties were uh, existed also, so much that two days before the meeting, I went to another priest, to the Nuncio. At that time, he was Monsignor Sambi, Pietro Sambi, who died recently in Washington. I begged him, Excellency, can we cancel this meeting of Notre Dame? Why? He said, because it will be a failure. No, I don't believe, I tell him, Excellency, the failure would be your failure, your personal failure, not mine. They would not tell Father William has failed. They would say the Nunzio has failed, because you asked for it. He said, I know. Even if it is a failure, we have to do it. I said, why? He said, you know our Holy Father is Polish, and Polish people are stubborn. <laughs> They don't change their mind, so please do it. Try to make out of it less, more, more than a failure. Try to do something. Miraculously, change things moved at the last uh, two days, and the failure was not as big as we expected. And what saved the situation is that the personality of John Paul II was so strong, so charming, and his speech was so well prepared that after his speech, we had at least for three minutes, all those who were present, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, they stood up and made a very strong applause to all what he said, because they believed that his speech is what was needed at that time in terms of interfaith dialogues. And you can read his speech on Vatican side, it's easy, you enter Vatican <coughs> VA, you put the year 2000, only 2000, and you look for speeches, Notre Dame, it was in March. If I am not wrong, March 20, 22 or 26, I don't remember now. And you can read this famous uh, speech done by the blessed John Paul. This speech saved the situation, which was expected to be a total failure. Uh, I don't want to enter into all the details of how to make a dialogue with Muslims and Jews. It's really a long speech, it needs a lecture in itself. But I want to say only this, that the Synod asked strongly from us to practice this dialogue, even when it seems to be useless. Just one detail, two weeks after the Synod, where we were invited to dialogue, there was the explosion in the Syrian Catholic Church of Baghdad, Our Lady of the Good Help, where many were killed, many Christians were killed. 
So this is happening two weeks after the seven. So those who were against this dialogue and who spoke about the uselessness of this dialogue found they were right and the others were wrong. Just an example. One month later came the explosion in Alexandria, the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church. You remember uh, this event. Fifth point, we are, we are concluding. Then if you wish, we can have an exchange. Five, fifth point is this, how to prevent Christian immigration from the Middle East. Uh, every year the number and percentage of Christian in the Middle East is shrinking, shrinking. Why Christians prefer to live outside the Middle East? It's easier. Uh, in Europe and the States and Canada and Australia, people are not uh, required to put their religion on the passport as here. Uh, religion is a private thing. So they are not, they don't suffer because of their faith. They don't feel restrictions because of their faith. So many left. Some are still leaving and want to leave. So the, the, the synod, the bishops, requested from us to help people to remain here. Why? Not because of economical encouragement or because of any promise. It's because of theological reason. Christians have to remain in the Middle East because remaining in the Middle East is a vocation, is a call of God. The Lord wants us to live here and to witness for our faith. This is what the Senate said in, in one of his recommendations and in the message itself. We have to remain here, to live our faith here. It's a blessing and a privilege to be Christian in the Middle East, much more a Christian in the Middle East. If Christians understand that, really it's very, very important, knowing that the Lord will help us to live our faith here. Uh, I conclude, these are the five points of the Synod. <coughs> these are the five points of the Synod. We still have to live the Synod. We started to live it, but we need years and years to implement all what was written in the recommendations. Thank you for your presence here, for your listening. And really, if you have any uh, comment or question, don't hesitate.